Okay, how's everybody doing this evening? Okay, very good, very good. Um, what we're going to talk about today is this concept of what's called the disarticulated state. What was the second one? State. 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 Oh, yeah. Right what I want you to oh. do in the United States, we have many layers of government. We have a national government. We have 50 state governments. Under that, we have thousands of local governments. And then we have thousands more of special districts. <laughs> which all have governmental powers and authority, which in essence, governmental authority, it's a monopoly power to provide a particular service, all right? Um, we will go into that as we move along. But as we, the photo that I have here are pieces of a puzzle, all right? And what I want you to start thinking of the services that are provided by the public sector, they're pieces of a puzzle, all right? Because different agencies and different governmental authorities provide services throughout your communities, uh, to, I would say, to support the entire community. But it can get confusing as you move along. And so we do a lecture on this. So you tend to understand what is the theory behind having so many different service providers. In essence, why is there not just one government that provides all the services? If it makes sense, why not? Why are there so many departments within one government that provide a whole host of services and some overlap? For example, a local there are, for say, the New York City, the police department. There's the NYPD. There's the transit police. There are a whole host of uh, uh, state agents that drive up and down some highways and patrol some parks. Does the park have a, a police officers? Park yeah. 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 Police officers? Yeah. Yeah. State parks. State and city parks. How about Highway 1? That's under the state. Yeah, it's a state, right? Yeah. Providing different agencies providing the same service. Why is that? Why doesn't one agency provide the same service? All right, the same jurisdiction. We're not going to answer every question tonight, but we're going to answer the theories behind that. We're going to get at the theory behind it, okay? As a mentioned, the amount of government, the sheer amount of governments, governmental entities that we have in the United States, in some way or another, are staggering. One national, which is easy to understand, 50 states, it's easy to get wrap your head around, for county government, which is really a creature of the state. One of the 50 states, provide the courts, hospitals, Sometimes roads, school districts. Most places that's about it. Some places they're more sophisticated. It's about 3,000. In New York City, where there are five, one for each borough. In terms of municipalities, there's about 20,000 in the country. Smaller townships, about 16,000. Townships are more creatures back east. They're more back east. Um, school districts, how we provide our education in the United States, 13,000. 506. That every once in a while, that number continues to fluctuate. But there's also a, a special designation, a special purpose district. Utilities, fire, policing, water, so forth and so on. 
they're usually a specialized uh, governmental entity that provides one particular service to an area. <coughs> about 87,000 or 87,576 governmental entities within the United States. That's a lot. All with their own mission, wide variety of citizens, wide range of services that they provide. And it's intuitive, we can ask the question, why uh, is there not one government? We'll say, well, because one government is too big. Um, there's the differences in the region. Okay, well, there's state governments, right? Well, states are too big, local governments. Once you go down, there's a lot of special districts. metropolitan area is about 8.2, 8.3 million people that live in New York City. Does anyone know how many people live within the area, the entire metropolitan, New York metropolitan region? Somebody's got to know that. 20 million, 6 million? 20 million. You said 20 million. Natasha, there you go. See, she knows. All right? 20 million large metropolitan region in the country. Less people live inside New York City than live around New York City. Has anyone ever thought about why? Less people live. Inside New York City than live around New York City in the it's metropolitan area. It's expensive because of the transportation. The tra what about transportation? It makes it easier to get almost anywhere in New York from within the city than it does if you're outside the city. Okay, so why do more people live outside the city than inside the city? Because it's cheaper. More people live outside the city than in the city. Thank you. Thank you. So it's cheaper to live outside. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's quite, and it's, quite it's not, you know, it's cheaper and people want a place to live than a place where they can, where they can live, you know? Okay. I think it's cheaper. Different characteristics, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do they get more government funding outside because there's more people yeah. live outside? Yeah. Well, like when they do the census. Um, census. You're talking about based upon the census impacts the votes, <coughs> uh, uh, the amount of uh, people in an area. That means there uh, impacts the congressional representation, which would impact funding for yeah. a big, big city or uh, district. <coughs> well. That's a ramification of a uh, population movement around a metropolitan area. But the, big, the, the basic question is, why are there so many cities outside of New York City? Why isn't the entire area, metropolitan area, just one big city? New York. Because at one point, for the most part, New York was the main city. It still is the main city. But there weren't so many suburbs around it. I mean, if you travel from New York, if someone lives in uh, uh, White Plains and they travel to, say, Europe, do they say on the White Plains? No. New York. Because people will recognize that, right? Okay. Um, there are thousands of smaller governments. Okay. Well, Can you give us an answer though? Why did more people live outside than inside? <laughs> Why? Yeah. Because of growth. And as we go through the uh, exercise, we'll, we'll go over the. Uh, we'll go over this. Okay. We'll go over the answer. Okay. It's amenities. It's characteristics. It's choice. Mm -hmm. Ability. People trying to maximize what they can consume the resources that they have, right? So you're always trying to maximize and get the best for what you have, right? Los Angeles, second largest metropolitan region. About four million people live in the city. 
about 12 million people live around Los Angeles. There's thousands of small local governments there that provide the same services. Chicago, same thing. Uh, Dallas, Texas, same thing. The main thing here is that our metropolitan regions have large cities, urban cores, right? But then they have hundreds of smaller local government units around them who provide the same services. Schools, roads, policing, parks, libraries, hospitals, this, that, the other, whatever public service that local governments or special districts provide. And they're similar to what the big cities provide. But over, especially since the uh, interstate highways came in, there's been a rapid growth in suburbanization. We call it the post -war, uh, from the post-war, World War II period. Rapid growth suburbanization based on the highway. Now, this table goes over the top, the largest um, 10 metropolitan areas within the United States. The metropolitan statistical area, for the most part, is based upon uh, uh, trips, uh, trips that people take to work, meaning that if you live within a certain distance, an average distance, um, what people take, how far people travel back and forth to work every morning, say 30 miles, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, maybe an hour, some places, then you're within the economic metropolitan area. It tends to circle the primary economic engine of an area, which is the big city, the place, the business center. New York, New Jersey, as I said, was the largest. Mm -hmm. And this is the population of the city. And this is an estimate of how many people live around that city. So if you go down, we start looking at Los Angeles, 29% of the people in this region live in Los Angeles. Chicago, 28%. Dallas, 18%. And uh, Houston is probably the highest percentage. No, New York is the highest, and Houston is the second highest of people who actually live in that uh, large city in that metropolitan area. All right. But as you can see, for the most part, most people that live around the large city live outside of that city in the smaller suburbs that are there. So the question is, why? Is there a benefit to it or is there not a benefit to it? And why have we set up our system of governance in the United States in that manner? Because for the most part, the same services are being provided. Right. Any questions? Isn't that changing now? People who live outside the city, who live outside the city, who work in the city, have to pay a certain tax? That city tax rate You mean who live in the city? Who live outside the city, who work in the city. They now have to pay um, a city tax or a community tax or a some have to take well, the, that's very difficult for a government to implement. The only way that they can really do that, mm -hmm. taxing businesses mm -hmm. and the bridges, trains, mm -hmm. every uh, 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 mechanism that you, that's utilized for people that live outside the city to come into the, the city. Mm -hmm. the yeah, the tolls are going. And there's another, there's yeah, another way to do it when you file your taxes. For example, if you live in New York. Right. In New York, New Jersey, or vice versa, there's a form that you have to file. It's an out of state, um, it's called a uh, out of state resident. Even though you're working in that state, you're getting paid in that state, you're an out of state, uh, you, you live out of state. So you're a resident living out of the state. So they, they tax you on that state and they tax you on this state. And yeah, you get double tax. And it's a nightmare. Yeah.
Back to your original question, is it because the city is way smaller, less land, but they have everything going on there, and in the suburbs there's more land space? Well, in terms of uh, uh, economic uh, development and economic activity, uh, large cities are, are where the economic activity is concentrated. So the land values are higher, especially in the central business district and around those uh, districts. The further that you go out from an urban core, the lower the land prices are. The mm -hmm. mm -hmm. land prices are. Mm -hmm. But what's happened, especially since the post-World War period, post-World War II period, is that land prices outside the city were cheaper. So you can build new houses, right? But you get enough people, you can improve the school districts because of your tax dollars, all right? If the property values are higher, then bring in more tax dollars, but you have a lower population, uh, uh, lower or smaller per capita population. Meaning that you're developing new administrative systems, new uh, governmental services, things of that nature. But as you do that, if you have enough uh, revenue to move outside uh, of the urban core, then you can uh, collect your, uh, uh, you have certain, you have services, uh, be provided to you from the local governments, the municipal go governments that are outside of the core, and continue to work within, within the urban core. That's where we generate more revenue, right? That's what's been happening since the post-World War II period. But even before World War II, up to the 1800s, through the 1800s, into the early 1900s, the theory that really uh, drove uh, how we're going to deliver our municipal services or local government services wasn't to decentralize the urban areas. It was to really create larger governmental entities, local service provider entities, because it was thought that the concept of economies of scale will bring down the cost of service delivery. Mm -hmm. Economies of scale meaning the larger your public works department, the more cars you buy. Buy in bulk. You buy in bulk from a, a dealer, say like the GM or Ford factory, then they'll give you a cheaper rate. When you buy gas, right? When you uh, buy uniforms, when you purchase really anything, it was also thought that the more centralized your planning operation, meaning the management sitting down and planning how they're going to address an issue. You can address the issue because resources will be directed at that. How resource, how many, however many resources that management has available to them. But something happened post World War II period. Well, even before that. What public agencies are provided really is monopoly power to provide the services that are circumscribed within their charter. So municipalities, they're given the power to produce X and Y services. Provide the services necessary for the health, safety, and general welfare of the community. So policing, sanitary services, parks, so forth and so on. Water districts, they provide water. But when they're, these government entities are approved, they're given a monopoly power, meaning that they're the only service provider in that area to provide that service. Because the cost of providing that service, or initially starting up that service, is so great that the government, the state, the higher level of government, gives them authority to really be the only provider in that area. So it's illegal for anyone else to try to provide that service. But for the most part, each one of these services has a market failure. Meaning that in theory, the service is needed by society. 
but for some reason or another, the services that are produced by government or uh, public agency will be underproduced. And the services that are, many of the services, some of the services, regulatory affairs, they're trying to uh, keep certain, the production of certain uh, challenges in society from being overproduced. For example, you start a police department to mitigate crime, right? to make there a higher cost of doing crime in society. When it comes to um, like electricity, power, um, would Con Edison be considered as a monopoly or Con a Edison, supplier? Con Edison and all the other uh, Edisons around the country, they at one point were special utility districts. They provided monopoly power, start of capital, because investments needed to electrify the region were so great that they were, it was a deal that they needed these monopoly powers. Since the 1980s, it was uh, utility companies, uh, phone companies, um, many of the utilities that you have today, cable companies, um, were monopoly, were, and for the most part still are monopolies. But since the 1980s, um, the theory was to break up these monopolies and sell portions of them to private investors. But a lot of these companies still remain quasi-public, uh, having public protections, but they uh, uh, can raise more capital uh, on the open market. Meaning that they can sell bonds, uh, they have investors, uh, things of that nature. Yeah. So at one point they were a public utility, but now they're their private well, I have I had a question that came up from when I was living in um, concerning monopolies. So, like the hospital districts are considered public. Um, a public ho hospital public. district, yes. Okay. So, when you have, like for instance, let's say a hospital gets a grant to produce uh, a test or something that may cure like, cancer or look into cancer or whatever. Because um, currently, right now, Myriad is the only um, the only testing facility that is allowed to use the BRCA test to find whether or not you have the mutation for breast cancer or ovarian cancer. Okay. They're in court back and forth because other agencies are saying, well, you can't have a monopoly on that because this is something that impacts people's health across the board. However, the one judge has already stated that they can keep the monopoly on this. And so because of that, the test is like $3,000. Most insurance companies don't cover it. Would it be possible for the federal government or the state government to step in and say, you know what, this is wrong, this needs to be broken up and sold to other providers as well? Okay, there's a couple of things uh, in there. Let's uh, take it step by step. A hospital district, right? In theory, why would a hospital district even be started? What about the service that a hospital provides? Why would they need a special district? Well, why would they end up of individuals? Hospitals in that district. They care mm -hmm. people, yeah. right? Because you have different illnesses coming mm -hmm. in. Why won't the testing. private sector, why can't the private sector uh, step in? Take Not, because in certain communities, certain communities can't afford that. Yeah. Certain oh. communities don't have, don't have um, um, certain HMOs. I mean, HMO is different, the insurance is different. Like, I can go into a private sector with my insurance. I have a different type of insurance. You have some people that that have Medicaid, you know, um, other HMOs attached to it. So that's why it's broken up in different sectors. Okay, okay. Is there anyone else? 
healthcare is provided for people in general. And I think the services that are offered depending on, uh, like it could be like, uh, what is this, what is that, like Sloan Kettering. That's the hospital basically for the cancer of, and stuff. Let's right? to the theory of a, 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 a <laughs> hospital district, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what about what is it about healthcare? You mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned price, right? Mm -hmm. Now, health is something that everyone has to deal with. It's right. part of being a human being, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But in order to see someone who's specially trained in the the practice of health of medicine, mm -hmm. there's a cost involved, mm -hmm. right? And that part of that cost is the training that it takes to become a doctor or a nurse, so forth and so on. There's the facilities and, uh, and all the different uh, medicines and treatments and things like that, right? So there's a cost. In order for you to access that, you have to pay something, right? Now, in our society, uh, because we're not living in a, uh, say, collectivist society, um, where everyone has the same resources. Right. Some people can pay the cost mm -hmm. to go to the hospital mm -hmm. or to the doctor. Some people cannot. That's right. Right? So on one hand, in order if you're a hospital, you would need to, if someone can't pay, you can't see them. But somewhere in our political process, it's been deemed that if somebody is really sick, you have to see them. You should not refuse them service. An emergency room, they cannot, right? But um, if sometimes if you try to see a doctor, they won't see you unless you have certain type of insurance and so forth and so on. But uh, the thing is that there's a, a market failure in the provision of health care because the demand exceeds the supply, right? So then there's a justification to start a hospital district. Once you start a hospital district, that means uh, the hospital has a monopoly of, uh, uh, within that area for a certain type of uh, uh, service, of uh, hospital care in an area. But rarely does a, hospital, does a public hospital prevent a private hospital from competing because typically, typically the individuals that they're serving are different, mm -hmm. right? The need is so great uh, for the, uh, uh, the hospital and medical care to provide a public hospital that they're not directly competing, all right? So that's one. So they're given a monopoly with a certain type of insurance in a particular area, all right? Um, that's one. Now, if that hospital has a particular patent, mm -hmm. all right, that patent is, is uh, protected by some type of legal, uh, a legal patent. And uh, the theory behind the patent is that if someone is able to protect their uh, an intellectual property, then there's more incentive to invest in finding cures uh, to something. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's a special case about a, a public hospital, uh, finding some type of cure or some type of test that people need. <coughs> what they did is they're a public hospital, but then they paid for the patent. Mm -hmm. All right. So there's two separate uh, uh, things. They could be a public hospital, but uh, they exercise their legal right to protect that patent as private property or as intellectual property. Um, if the judge, well, that's 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 a, a legal question right there. Um, that's a, uh, they're, they're exercising the right as a private organization to have a private patent. So there's two different uh, uh, questions right there. Can they be sued to allow other people to utilize it? Maybe, or maybe not, right? Maybe they have the right since they have the patent to sell it like any other product that's on the market because a lot of medical products are sold then, right? If you don't have the money to pay for a certain uh, Medication, you can't, a lot of people can't access it. All right? Okay. 
Did I answer the question or? Yeah. Halfway. Yeah. As much as you could, I mean. <laughs> I didn't expect you to answer the legal question of it, but yeah, you answered the question as far as what I need to know for that. Okay. Now, the one thing about monopolies, the challenge that they have, any monopoly, is that they typically charge higher prices and they give less of a supply of whatever good that they're providing. This graph right here, this is price. The vertical is price and the horizontal is quantity. All right. Typically speaking, if there were a free market, the good would be, would be produced on this horizontal uh, uh, line extending outward. Uh, the marginal cost, this would be the marginal cost right here, the average cost, and the average quantity produced would be out here. Meaning that it would cost less and there would be more of it if there was competition. In theory, because there's no competition, the price is typically higher and the quantity is less. All right? All right, so that means that if you have the public hospital and the market value and how the private hospital comes into play. And you said like the need is so great that the two of them kind of, they don't really compete with each other. So now in essence, they both become monopolies? Because they're both uh, markets, not- For market segments, for market segments. But the thing about the private hospital is people are paying mm -hmm. a certain, uh, they have to have, have insurance to go to that private hospital. Mm -hmm. So the price that they're paying, they're competing with someone for the price of that insurance, there's competition there. Yeah. Typically, a, uh, a public hospital is based upon where you live, mm -hmm. uh, your address, mm -hmm. because there's tax dollars being paid to that. Yeah. For example, uh, when I live in Dallas, Texas, Dallas County has a, uh, a hospital district. It's the big public hospital in the area. It's on your tax bill. Uh, it's called Parker uh, Hospital District. Park, Parker Hospital District. It's on your tax bill. If you live in that county, you're paying taxes, you have a right to get to the hospital. It's a public hospital, right? Uh, now, there are a lot of private hospitals there, but if you don't have, say, a job or a job that provides insurance, you can't just walk into, the, into any hospital and be served, right? right? Um, okay. That's the rule over there? Or is that a rule in hospitals in general? In general. It's in general, because I went to my sign that they went to me at the time. I didn't have insurance. And they said you have to go to the, the city hospital, hospital where you live. Mm -hmm. And they sent me to the hospital where I live. But that's I funny because, because because I used to do discharge planning as a social worker and if the service is provided in like another another like borough, we cannot be you're not allowed to refuse because the hospital has a pool where they allocate money for people who come and don't mm -hmm. have insurance or people who cannot even make payments. In and essence, that's why yeah. it should be. But they told me, you do not have insurance, this is a private hospital. You do not have to see me, you do not have to go to the hospital, you live, of course. And when they call the hospital, they told me to go to the hospital, and I did that the hospital. I was all the way by my sign out, and they told me to have to go to the hospital. I mean, are we talking about, uh, uh, there's, there's multiple things here. If you if you uh, if you go to an emergency room, mm -hmm. or if you just want to go see uh, uh, a doctor, mm -hmm. they're, they're two different things. Go right. to an emergency room. There's a law that says exactly. they cannot. Exactly. Right. That's what I'm saying. No, I was in the emergency room, and they told me we cannot see you. You have to go. You to should have. Yeah. At the time, I was saying I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. Yeah, so that if you don't know, right? Yeah, they cannot refuse you. That is like one of the biggest problems. When I was 16, I didn't know that. I don't know if you were 16 that you knew that that was the case. But the older you get, you learn more information. But at the time, if an adult tells you, 
Yeah. Well, me. But if an adult tells you to do something, you do it. Mm -hmm. And they told me to do. So that's just what I did. Mm -hmm. But now I have to learn that the mm -hmm. hard way. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I have insurance, right. I can go to any doctor mm -hmm. for now. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember I was uh, 14. My mom had insurance. She was working. She changed jobs. She didn't work there anymore. We didn't have insurance for some time. Went back to the doctor and said, we can't see you. Right. You got to uh, you know, you go through a loop. But that's part. That's a common story mm -hmm. in our uh, our country. You know, I mean, on one hand, you know, people they fight mm -hmm. to get access to medical care. Yeah. But just as well, uh, how, uh, how, just like people are fighting to get access to medical care, there are a lot of people who are fighting to prevent people from having access to medical care mm -hmm. because it costs money. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive. <laughs> right. Um, Um, so the main, just theoretically, monopolies produce less and the price is high. Right. Why? No competition. No revenue. Well, there's revenue generated. But it's not generated as much in an, in an effort to sustain. So say, for example, if we have, we will have higher prices because there's not enough I want to say, say for example, we're dealing with a hospital. We're dealing with a private sector versus a public sector. A private sector will charge more because they specialize, they have all the services, they have all the equipment. So the price is going to be slightly higher than going to like Mount Sinai, which is a private hospital, in Palm Hospital, which is a public hospital. So the services you receive at Mount Sinai is totally different compared to the services you receive at Palm Hospital. Yes, yeah, but even uh, and you're comparing, but right. what if there is even no comparison? So if there is no comparison, then then we would have to look at what's being provided. What exists. What exists. Right? Mm -hmm. So you have to look at what exists. And then you have less information because you don't really know what's going in uh, to all the costs mm -hmm. of the provision of service. Mm -hmm. When you have something to compare it with, that opens up a whole other world, mm -hmm. right? A whole other dimension. Mm -hmm. And knowledge is knowledge is power, mm -hmm. right? When we don't have knowledge, it creates a problem. That's the trouble when you have one provider, a service provider. You don't know specifically what is all included in that cost. Public agencies, it's just a typical community. Mm -hmm. uh, hospitals, that's the hospital, Parkland Hospital. Fire, services, parks, waste removal, water, services, libraries, public safety whole host of services, and there's even more, right? Each one of these services is crucial for society to provide a good, quality life for residents, right? We need agencies that are equipped and that have the resources to provide the services that we need if we're living in a complex society. Right, provide a middle class lifestyle, and also to address any social issues that we have in society. So it's not like the services are not needed; they're definitely needed, right? And, be, and to be provided at a high quality, mm -hmm. because mediocrity, really, in a lot of ways, is just not it's not acceptable. problem that we have always had in the field of public administration, because of the nature of the services that are provided, do we really know the true cost of providing public service? Do we really know? I mean, on one hand, we have the budgets. We see how much people get paid, right? The salary, benefits, equipment. Right? Ancillary services. We can add up the cost of the buildings, vehicles. We can add up all of that stuff. So we know, right? But do we truly know if that's the most efficient and effective method of providing service? Can it be cheaper? Or is it being provided at the lowest cost that it possibly can? Any public sector workers, can you answer this? In my job, I can honestly say 
we definitely could cut costs. Um, we been, I work for VA, but they're starting to clean up based off of what happened in Phoenix. There's some bad stories come out, right? Yeah, and um, what was determined, although I knew it because I'm going to pay more first, is that we were outsourcing different testing and different things like that. We were paying three times what it would have cost us just to purchase the machine and do the test ourselves. And that's just scratching the surface. Yeah. Right? I'm not going to go into what more, but we have physicians that are now who were working at both the NYU and at the VA collecting Basically, you have one physician that will come in as long as they come into the building and get paid five thousand dollars for that day for just coming into the building. They never had to see a patient, never had to do any consultation work. Just if they walked in the building, we had to pay them because that's the way the contract was set up. That's the way the contract works, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. What you doing? What? What are you doing? Yeah. Instead of utilizing the money, instead of building affordable housing, they'd rather pay that money to keep you in a shelter. 
Now they're coming out with different programs. Now, now here we have all these other entities that's coming in where they, they have the, this program called the LINK program. Mm -hmm. They have um, Section 8 voucher mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. a voucher it program. <laughs> yeah, it's not, no, it's just a voucher program. It's mm -hmm. not Section, section 8. eight yeah. It's like if they place you in an apartment, the apartment is Section 8, mm -hmm. but it's a Section 8 you can't move you with. Can, yeah. You, it's you Section 8 as long as you move in. Mm -hmm. But they're coming out with all these different programs instead of just thinking on one line. And you're pulling all these other people in, but you're not paying the people that's there. Mm -hmm. You know? This is where people get shortchanged too, where, where if you're working for an agency and they're paying all this stuff out, mm -hmm. you're, not you're, you're not getting your work mm -hmm. as the worker. Mm -hmm. So we, we look at those things and the type of insurance that they wind up getting. Mm -hmm. From a managerial perspective, what do you think they're doing? I mean, one person said they're starting to give out uh, contracts, uh, they're keeping some of the workers in underfilling positions. Okay. But that's they're trying, to, that's they're smart. trying things over there. No, but here, here where I'm at, I think they I think they spin in silly. It's being really spent silly, you know? Instead of instead of, you know, focusing on what the problem is, it's homelessness. Why do you want to constantly keep building shelters and then give them crazy programs that really have the landlords don't even accept these programs, you know? So it's like you're beating a dead horse where on the other hand she stated that what she's doing in her agency, mm -hmm. that that makes sense. Let's use the people here and it saves money and maybe we can give raises and maybe we can give this where, where things are being taken from you mm -hmm. and given out to everything and it's not really, it's not doing anything. Well, as you move along, and as we see, I'm hearing a lot of different ideas, right? A lot of different things that are going on in the organizations, some good, some bad, right? Mm -hmm. But in this, we're still scratching the surface. Is it is uh, are the resources being used as efficiently as or, and as effectively as possible within these organizations? Now everybody can always point to some sort of waste, some uh, way that something can be uh, can be done. Mm -hmm different way because on the one hand something can be done in one manner that is very efficient in that particular manner but if another tool is implemented or brought in maybe it can be done twice as fast three times as fast <laughs> for a lower cost right right but you never know unless that new tool is brought in yeah um, but the answer to this question, do we really know the full cost? No. 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 <laughs> not for the monopoly, not for the a monopoly. You can never know. Why? Because, first of all, with any public agency, any public agency, is public oversight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This due process. Mm -hmm. When it's public oversight and due process for any good, that means there's negotiation. Mm -hmm. Layoffs. Uh -huh. Just negotiation. <laughs> and that's called layoffs. Layoff. <laughs> yeah, I agree, that's called layoffs. <laughs> it could be higher. <laughs> yeah. 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 What did Boss Tweed do? We went over here uh, at the introduction of public administration. Mm -hmm. His big thing was not laying off people. His big thing was dictating and job. manipulating he, people. He said that way he created jobs. But he, he was, was manipulating them. He was a puppet master. But he did yeah. some good through all his greed. You know. no, but he still was a part of it. It always had a um, motive behind it, a negative motive. <laughs> okay, so we never know the full cost, the true cost of providing, uh, especially public services. Mm -hmm. Because the difference between a public agency and a for-profit agency is a for-profit agency, you know how well they're doing by the revenue that is generated. They produce something that has a tangible return. Even if it's a service, there is some sort of price for the good that's produced. For the public sector, 
and this increasingly, uh, this increasingly in this nonprofit sector, the increasing size of the nonprofit sector, the services that are provided is hard to measure. You can, it's hard to quantify. Just how much safer did this community become? You can take statistics, murders, assaults. The numbers can be flat over a year, but crime is also a perception. How do people feel? If something just happened and you survey people, then people are going to be in more fear. If something happened quite some time ago, right? Also, with education, just how much did that individual get out of the class? <laughs> they can take a test. Some people can do very well in school. You put them in the professional world, and they're not the best. Not to say that you don't do well. I want you all to do well in here. <laughs> I'm saying that there's always sometimes there's a disconnect between uh, theory and practice. But yes. Okay. Yes. Just um, um, I want to say something because I think that when you place a person in in their profession, say for example, I went to school and I did my MBA, so I'm new, I understand the job and things like that. I always my motto is it takes six months to learn my job and one year to master. So when, I, when I'm freshly graduated out of school, then I know that it's going to take me six months to actually put theory to practice in one year to master it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, that's, that's very good. But for my, for my uh, background is in uh, city government, city planning. Mm -hmm. We have some of the smartest people work uh, in public agencies. <laughs> um, they have a lot, they're, they're theoretically grounded and they know how to uh, write the laws and get them implemented. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the political process is very difficult. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of public hearings involved. The legal process is there. Sometimes you know, in theory, something needs to be done to address unemployment in an area, mm -hmm. or economic development, even to improve education. Mm -hmm. Something needs to be done. However, it's very difficult to get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to learn to talk to people. You have to have public hearings. That can be very contentious sometimes. Mm -hmm. You have to sit there, listen to about 100 people line up, tell you what you are <laughs> and where you need to go. Right? But that theory is telling you if this is done, we can increase uh, jobs in the area. More people will benefit from it. They may, in theory, be harmed by it. So forth and so on, right? But there are always winners and losers in any major, uh, uh, major thing that's done, especially in public policy. So back to it. You can have all the ideas. Then it's up there. To turn it into reality, that's another game, right? And in essence, you have to be very strategic mm -hmm. at that. Sometimes a textbook cannot tell you exactly. how to get there. Exactly. Agreed. Or a midterm, you know, Agreed. Or midterm, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what will tell you how to do it is to get out there and talk to people, mm -hmm. learn from people. That's now, if you're the type of individual that only sits around people who look like you, think like you, talk like you, and have there. the same uh, profession as you, then you're going to stay there. If you want to rise above and be a, a game changer, you need to learn to talk to people and learn things from people who don't think like you. Mm -hmm. exactly. Exactly. Definitely, you don't look like you, you don't live where you live. You have a different perspective on the world because that is going to force you to change the way that you see the world. Mm -hmm. Because in essence, if you communicate, you can learn to see or get a glimpse of the world from their shoes. Right. And if you want to be effective at playing this game of politics, you have to understand the opponents. Mm -hmm. You have to understand where they're coming from. Because in essence, we're all human, right? So, in terms of public agencies, 
It's very difficult because they're monopolies to understand the true cost because there's no direct competition. There's no incentive to bring down the cost to really go through every operation and keep the cost as minimal as possible because the incentive isn't there. Right. One question. Yes. So you're saying that it's very difficult to find it, but it is possible to find the true cost? This all is always possible, but in theory it's very difficult because you're not going to have the information. No one's going to have the information. You have the information on the inputs, mm -hmm. but you it's very difficult to know how to reconfigure those inputs mm -hmm. to, uh, to bring about a lower cost. Mm -hmm. And in theory, you can find it in theory, but in actuality, you may not be able to because it takes a lot of creativity, ingenuity, and you have to, the people who are actually doing it know the job better than anyone that's on the outside, mm -hmm. right? It's a basic, uh, goes back to a basic mm -hmm. concept. <clears throat> Somebody's been doing it 10, 15 years, they're going to know the ins and outs of something mm -hmm. way more than someone who's just, uh, who studied, well learned, mm -hmm. who goes and looking over someone's shoulder. They're going to show you what, you, what they want you to see, mm -hmm. right? Okay. It's also because public agencies are labor intensive. Human capital, highly skilled, highly specialized jobs. 60 to 70 percent of the budget goes to labor of most public agencies. All right? About 30 percent facilities. When you need more revenue, a public agency or any type of monopoly. Instead of cutting wages, it's easier to raise price because the people who are paying the price are typically not as organized as the labor from a managerial perspective. From a theoretical perspective, monopolies tend to charge a higher price and produce less. But also, it's the political cost that cannot be calculated. Why are certain laws there? Why are there certain steps and procedures that need to be taken? And the one thing that really, set, one of the things that, primary thing that separates public agencies from private business, and the one thing that makes government very inefficient is due process. The government cannot take life, liberty, or property from an individual without due process, meaning there has to be, you have to state what it is, what regulation uh, someone uh, falls within, what law or regulation do they break, and give them an opportunity to respond back, then have a public hearing. In that public hearing, these opportunities, or an appeal. All right. That's the foundation of our democratic process. To get rid of that is to get rid of democracy. It can't be done. Also, the policy making process it has to be negotiation. Without negotiation, laws cannot get passed, whether they're at the local level, state level, Federal level. There has to be a plurality to approve vote. Without a majority, nothing can get done. And what does it take to get a majority? Negotiation. Politics is a dirty game. Everyone wants something. say this, but people sit on these uh, uh, public boards because they love their communities? Yeah, right. yeah, of course right. they do, right? Yeah. 
They do, but at some point, they have to make a decision. Right? Sometimes, to get a vote, people need to be swayed. And I'm not saying with uh, uh, money, but what I am saying is the ideology. That's a quick pro quo, right? Yes, it's also ideology. Voting with the group. Mm -hmm. It's uh, incentivizing. Mm -hmm. It's showing that this is a better way to go than another, right? Have you guys ever heard of the concept of bureaucratic capture? No, I haven't. It's something that comes out of Washington, D.C. There's, for the most part, you've heard of lobbyists. Yes. What are lobbyists? What are they um, lobbyists? I heard. Oh. What are lobbyists?
get that woman sitting behind Montana Senator Max Baucus. He's the Democrat who's the chairman of the Finance Committee. Liz Fowler is her name. And now get this. She used to work for WellPoint, the largest health insurer in the country. She was vice president of public policy. And now she's working for the very committee with the most power to give her own company and the entire industry exactly what they want. After Obamacare passed, Senator Baucus himself, one of the biggest recipients in Congress of campaign cash on the industry, boasted that the architect of this legislation was none other than the industry insider, Ms. Fowler. Now I want to single out one person. And that one person is sitting next to me. Her name is Liz Fowler. Liz Fowler is my chief health counsel. Liz Fowler is with my team together, the health healthcare team. She put together the, the, the white paper last November 2008, um, 87 page document, which became the basis, the foundation. She goes better with the one behind him. She wants to put together the white paper, that 85 page. <laughs> he said, it has to be the white paper about the 85 page. He He's not. <laughs> 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 Which which became the basis, the foundation, the blueprint from which almost all health care measures and all bills, both sides of the aisle, came from. She's an amazing person. She's a lawyer. She's a PhD. She's just so decent. She's always smiling. She's always working. So it's always available to help any center, any staff. And I just I thank Liz. She got there. If you don't say something really nice, she's going to let it all out. She got there. The healthcare industry was very pleased, too. Early on in the evolution of Obamacare, the Senate and the White House cut deals that protected the interests of the healthcare industry, mm -hmm. especially the insurance and pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. Lobbies beat back such popular proposals as a public option expansion of Medicare and a requirement that drug companies negotiate the prices they charge. As the eagle-eyed Ben Greenwald wrote in The Guardian last week, the bill's mandate Pass. I don't doubt that, but it's not the point. She's emblematic of 
of a revolving door culture that inevitably means when push comes to shove, that corporate interests will have the upper hand in the close calls that determine public policy. It's how insiders fix the roof of the market, no matter which party is in power. The last time we looked, 34 former staff members of Senator Baucus, whose finance committee has life and death power over industry's wish list, were registered lobbyists. More than a third of them working on health registered lobbyists. More than a third of them working on health care issues in the private sector. And the revolving door spins even faster after a big election like the one we had last month, as scores of officials, elected representatives, and their staff vacate their offices after the ballot. <laughs> so was that something good or bad? I'm confused. Well, it's freezing. I don't know. I don't know what they were trying to say about her. I think mean, she's making it. She's she's saying she, she, she's like, now influencing policy that she was like, has to benefit the company, benefit the company that she now works for. Now she works for she, she goes to Johnson and Johnson now. She was all in the mix of it anyway. She started you know, she, she used to work for them. She started working for the government. She no, she worked for the government and then went to Johnson and Johnson. She started a reform that would make her new job profitable. So I had doctors with the right. Yes. I got it. I'll give you one second. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to set this thing up.
where they were going to create a system, an option that was financed by the federal government for anyone who wanted to go use that uh, insurance to use instead of having to use private insurance. Could it have been cheaper? Yeah, okay. Okay. You don't know. Then they went profit. You never know. Other countries do it. Other countries do it, right? But it's not about money. It's about money. It could have been. It could have been cheaper and probably a bit more efficient as well. Because we don't know, right? Right. The main thing that I want you to grab out of this is that for any major piece of legislation, a any piece of legislation, negotiations take place. There are always people working behind the scenes to make for to make the deal happen, so to speak. And in doing that, because of our democratic process, the most efficient method of actually carrying out or delivering a public service isn't necessarily going to be the method that's adopted. Because there's always politics involved in some way or another. This is a democratic process, right? And inside of that, there's due process. So a lot of times the laws are written for our public agents, agencies, and administrators to be guided by, a lot of times it's not the most efficient that could have uh, uh, been conjured up at the time, but it was necessary to get the law passed to begin with. So yes. is that what it is trying to interpret as far as direct revolving tool when it came to the lady, the lady? Well, the revolving door, uh, it's thought of as a challenge, especially for people who are concerned about the federal budget or uh, corporate America's uh, grasp upon the, uh, uh, the policymaking process. Um, because in essence, many of times, individuals that, or companies that have a lot of resources uh, are always able to hire individuals uh, from the agencies who are supposed to be enforcing or providing oversight uh, to a lot of the uh, uh, large companies within our country. And in doing that, they're hiring the people who know mo most on how to enforce regulations or who know most about these companies, so to speak. Or who know the loopholes in the laws because they were enforcing them for so long. That creates a challenge for reform of government. Because knowledge is power, correct? If you have the individuals on your side that have all knowledge, right? It goes back to principal agent theory, right? How do you cut out the waste? Well, the only person that's going to know what the waste is are the people who've been managing it for so long, right? This has been a question and challenge that the field of public administration has been wrestling with for decades, decade after decade after decade. Because we know the input, and we can try to measure the output, but do we know if we're being, uh, if our agencies are being as, as effective and as efficient as possible? And this really comes up when politicians are elected and they want to clean up government. They want to lower taxes. They want to make sure that the services that are delivered are the best for the citizens. Then they get elected to government. <laughs> politicians realize they cannot hire and fire for the civil service. The window of opportunity, election cycle is four years. Administrators are there once they're in for life. Yep. So it creates a challenge. Yeah. 1970s, there was a large push to try.
try to really uh, uh, incorporate economic models or utilize economic models to try to get a handle on how to influence the behavior of administrators and bureaucrats. bureaucrats. The first was uh, Miskinen, 1971, Bureaucracy and Representative Government. Rep uh, bureaucracy, meaning this, uh, these administrators, lack of appointment, hard to control, but you never know what's really going on within the agency. You only know what they tell you. Representative government, being the government should belong to the people, not just the bureaucrats, administrators. The theory that came out is used principal agent theory, meaning if you are an elected politician, you can vote on the budget, then you try to create incentives to impact action, actions of administrators. Find a way to incentivize them to act in one way and penalize them for acting in another. In theory, it sounds good. Practice is difficult. Ostrom, Intellectual Crisis of Public Administration. He argued that you can use the concept of public choice, rational choice, again, to influence the way that administrators operate. And there's more to this uh, debate, but we don't need to really get into now. But it's also that we can also set up a system that's really operational in our system of fragmented government that rational choice fits the model that we already use. But the most developed and modern uh, uh, articulation of this ration, how rational choice can be uh, implemented in public agencies is through this Osborne and Gabler reinvention government. If we uh, go over this in the management uh, course, but it's really, in essence, bring private sector methods into the delivery of public service. One, by the use of contract and out services. Two, by the use of creating incentives it through the budgeting process. Three, by providing administrators more flexibility and latitude, i.e. discretion in carrying out their day-to-day -day functions. Also by creating performance measures, measuring outputs instead of inputs. All this is public choice theory, meaning incentivizing, incentivizing the dollars. Right. Tebow, 1956, Peer Theory of Local Expenditures. This model, <coughs> developed in 1956, has been expanded upon over the decades. But this really gets at applying public choice theory to the, to the delivery of public services in a metropolitan area, metropolitan region. And remember, from the beginning of the, uh, the lecture, this articulated state. In every metropolitan area, there's a core city, and there's hundreds of municipal jurisdictions around special districts. So we're talking about school districts. We're talking about uh, city governments, right? Police and services. Uh, roads, types of houses, so forth and so on. In this paper, it's argued that the more competition there is in the delivery of public services in a region, through there being a wide variety of choices of local uh, uh, municipal jurisdictions for the people to live within. 
First of all, there will be better services. Because local agencies will be forced to compete for residents, for higher quality residents, meaning higher income residents. This is economics. Everything is measured by income. Right? Because the governments are always competing for tax revenue. So in theory, within a major metropolitan area, every city is competing with one another for tax revenues. That comes in the form of housing taxes, business taxes. Right? Talk about school districts, talk about local governments that deliver policing economic development, roads, infrastructure, what we saw. It's also a way to keep the cost of the provision of public services down. Because if governments are competing with one another, they, they cannot just continue to raise taxes at any rate that they wish. Because if they raise taxes too high, the jurisdiction right next to them will not raise taxes and they may get more investment, more development, because they're all competing for capital investment. So under this theoretical framework, the way that you keep the delivery, the cost of the delivery of public services as low as possible within a metropolitan region is through competition. And the key term here is that residents will vote with their feet. If a place provides a good environment, that people would want to move there. If the environment is not good, the services are not good, then people will move away. Mm -hmm. If they can afford. Right? That's the caveat. But in this framework right here, if you cannot afford it, You're not wealthy. You're not a wealthy resident, right? You're not maximizing the tax revenue of the local jurisdiction, right? Because the goal of the local jurisdiction is to increase their tax revenue, right? Not to decrease increasing uh, revenue, decrease expenditure. Right? So in theory, if you cannot pay uh, to move to this area, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, these are two uh, school districts, local school districts, uh, Mount Vernon and New Rochelle. I did a little uh, comparison. This is the most recent data from the Westchester County. New Rochelle was quite some, some time ago. I don't know why. But um, the population of these cities is very similar, 67,000, 77,000. Mount Vernon, though, had 11,000 parcels of land. New Rochelle had 16,000. Does everyone know what a parcel of land is? It's a piece of property. Uh, every piece of property in the city or in the county um, ha has an assessor number. Uh, that assessor number is a, uh, the number of the property. Uh, the number that's given to each piece of property is for tax purposes. Yeah, what number? Well, lots of block is an area, but then in that there's a, uh, there's a number, right? So there's 16,000. Okay. Now every piece of property is assessed by government to see what the market value is. And that's going to determine how much taxes will be owed on that piece of property. All right? So assessed value 
Uh, the entire city of Mount Vernon was uh, 153. Uh, it says a million. It should be. Yeah, million. 153 million. Yeah, it has to be three more zeros there. Uh, New Rochelle was 272 billion. And this is also an indicator of the uh, average home price. Uh, at New Rochelle was 583. And Mount Vernon was 334. <coughs> Median income, household income, 47,000 and 64,000. Uh, and school district budgets, uh, they're both about 200, 220 billion, uh, 210 million. Mm -hmm. So they're about the same, right? They look the same, similar on paper. If you didn't live in the area, you wouldn't. This, this is what you saw. It's similar. However, if you do a little scratching beneath the surface, they're radically different school districts. Test scores, demographics, mm -hmm. the community, the wealth in the communities are radically different. All right. Now, on one hand, Everyone needs an education. Everyone goes through the education process, right? So how do you determine in our, in our society which school district or which school people go to? How's that determined? Some people are zoned in zone. The zone of the school? Some schools are zoned a zip code. Uh, mm -hmm. when you, if you're in that zip code, district, that's your public school. Yeah, right. But you don't have to necessarily go to that school. Mm -hmm. That's the school that you're guaranteed to see that because it's your zone school, it's your safety school. Mm -hmm. But you can venture outside of those areas through testing and applying to other types of schools, private schools, um, citywide schools. schools. Citywide schools. Like, citywide. Uh, so I'm talking about New York City. What if I live? And Mount Vernon, and I want to go to school in New Rochelle. You can't do that. You would have to get a New Rochelle. Why not? You have to get somebody with a New Rochelle address. <laughs> yes. 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 Why would you need a New Rochelle address? Because it's different here in New Rochelle. If you don't make enough money, it goes to Maybe um, your, 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 class your class level and maybe your IQ. Yeah, if you live in Mount Vernon, you, you don't make enough to go to New Rochelle. That's the residency. Like if you, you're a resident of New Rochelle, then you're privileged. Then, then you, you're privileged to go to school in New Rochelle. Why is that? Why is it where you live? Because of course the living is your school district, right? It's your school. What is the school district? It's the local government. It's one of these uh, 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 units of government, right? Because you live there, you pay taxes there, right? On paper, a lot of them look equal. If you just look at the numbers, but the outcome is not equal. That's right? Mm -hmm. It's determined based upon where you live. But where you live is based on a function of income. For the most part, does everyone know what zoning is? See a lot of blank stairs? Everywhere in every city, is broken down into zones. The local government does that. Housing, businesses, manufacturing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And every zone has a particular list of uses that can go there. But it also demarcates how the building has to look, the size of the building. How many parking spaces? How much landscape? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How high? Floor area ratio? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, based upon some of these zone requirements, it impacts the type of housing that can go into an area. And the type of housing that can go into an area impacts the value. Mm -hmm. How much people have to pay to move to that area. All right. 
So for example, the city can zone, if there's a, an area, housing, uh, has to be 7,000 square foot house, no, 7,000 square foot lots. The house has to be about 2,000 square feet, have a certain amount of uh, yards, front yard space, backyard space, a couple parking, a garage, so forth and so on, right? Or the city can say, you can build 100 stories high, the units have to be uh, no larger than 400 square feet, and uh, that's about it. What type of uh, unit would be more expensive out of the two I described? No, the high one, it's like, is it commercial? Well, if, it, if it's Manhattan. Let me, uh, let me back up a little bit. Because we are in Manhattan, all right? Mm -hmm. Or New York City. You can get on to that. The type of, uh, the way uh, cities, they cannot dictate specifically how much the property will cost but they can dictate the type of oh. development that goes into an area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right? Mm -hmm. um, if, again, back to the theory, you're competing with other jurisdictions for investment, right? Local tax, uh, taxes through uh, housing and taxes through uh, business, businesses, what type of uh, uh, individual or families are you trying to uh, bring to your yeah. community? Well, working, working families. Working families that can afford a certain type of house, right? Yeah. Because that's going to bring, that's going to be tax revenues for the property, mm -hmm. and it's going to bring in businesses, because that's how businesses locate to an area. Mm -hmm. But also, on the same token, you want to bring in as much money as you can, but you don't want to expend as much money uh, mm -hmm. necessary. Right. That's why typically outside of your larger cities, you have more single family residential, mm -hmm. right? Bigger properties. You have a lot of uh, a discouragement of a lot of low income multifamily. Mm -hmm. It's produced, but not as a, uh, uh, at a rate like in, in, such, in uh, New York City or Newark, right? The main thing to get here is that cities can impact the type of residents that go there. Zoning is the mechanism, all right? Now, there's been a lot of studies on this fragmentation, improved services or not. There's a lot of disagreement. But there are some statistical findings that are key. Middle income and wealthier families can typically afford to move out into the suburbs. And typically the, the, the metropolitan uh, the cities or the school districts outside of the central city mm -hmm. tend to have better educational outcomes, mm -hmm. meaning more students actually graduate, mm -hmm. not just graduate with better test scores. In essence, get a better quality of education. Mm -hmm. That education mm -hmm. impacts your employability. Mm -hmm. right. And that employability impacts your income, as you go forward, so forth and so on. Right? So we're talking about access. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the reading school of school of the capitalist America this study was done in the 1970s. Then back to the two, then done again back in the 2000s. And the main thing here, what they found, is that if you want to really know how uh, uh, students will fare in life from a young age, you don't. Their test scores, their standardized test scores will tell you something, but that's not the best indicator. Their behavior will tell you something, and all of that's a fair indicator, it's not the best indicator. They say the best indicator 
is look at the social economic status of their parents. Because statistically speaking, even though in our nomenclature, the American story, the American dream is not to stay in the same social economic status as your parents, statistically speaking, most people do. Schools in areas, they tend to train children to assume the same roles in society as their parents. So if it's a working class area, mm -hmm. they focus more being there on time, uh, don't bend the rules, so forth and so on. Because if you do, then you'll get uh, your punishment, things of that nature. Wealthier areas, they train children to lead. Think outside the box, be creative, not to be stuck in the boundaries that exist, but to understand those boundaries, talk about mental, and to, to, to work that to create something new. But all this difference in education type is also about resources, underlying resources, the best quality education. Right? Those resources are determined, predicated upon the tax dollars received by that local jurisdiction. All right? As we move along, I want you to see that this disarticulated state is a mechanism that really entrenches inequality within our society. It is probably one of the primary mechanisms that locks inequality within our society because education is the equalizer. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a video on here for you to watch at home. I'm not gonna make you stay here and watch it. But watch it, because it will be a test question. All right, it's 30 minutes, it's a pretty good video. Long Island, it's a little in two different communities. And you really get to see the difference and the education that the students are getting based upon the environment that's created. And the environment that's created, a lot of, in a lot of ways, is impacted based upon the resources that that school has. And that's based upon the resources that the community has. All right? But what separates those, uh, those areas are the service providers, governmental service providers. All right? Any questions? Yeah, I can go. I'll be here. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, everybody, listen. Uh, I thought of some. Uh, I brought up last night. Uh, I put together a study abroad trip to Brazil. Uh, probably by the end of the week, I have it approved. Uh, it'll be from January 9th to January 19th, which is MLK Day. Um, I will start uh, presenting it at the beginning of classes next week, and I'll probably have an information session at the end of next week, uh, that following Monday or Tuesday. All right? Uh, so I'll provide that information. So that's all your classes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have a selection. My, me and my people that uh, work with me will do a selection process. But generally speaking, listen, uh, the last year, the people who wanted to go, there was a wide range of people. They went. All they had to say was, I want to go, and they stuck with it. Right. They ended up going.
comments from the committee mm -hmm. name of it. Uh, okay. And I sent you my resume. Okay, okay. All right, I'll meet you. Listen. Okay. I know. I'm going to get to you, all right? No, God, I'm on time. I know it's seven more months. And I'm mad that I missed an information session because I could be studying now. Yeah. You got everything? You got the group? No. Me and Lisa. Okay. That's it. But I'm exhausted. I'm over. I'm coming for a knockout. Okay. We'll go get some sleep. And I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. My suggestion to you is you need to make contact with people and continue to work through. Um, if you two are lost, then you need to get found. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the best way to say that's it. That's a good way to say yeah. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. We just work and everything else. Yes, Andrew.